Good afternoon. It's good to be here. Uh, the challenge for an afternoon session is always you have a different kind of experience. <laughs> so I'll do my best. Um, well, I'm glad that Mark um, shared a broad spectrum of what uh, is design. I'd like to um, go in depth to talk about the difference between traditional uh, management transformation and design thinking. So this will help you appreciate how we use design as a strategy, not design as packaging, but really design for systemic change. 14 years ago, when I founded my company, we were a few crazy. You know when you're young, you're nuts, and you think you can change the world. And it's good that you're young. But even though two of my partners, they, get, they are the age of my, they can be my dad if they want to. But still, because I was young and adventurous, they were not so adventurous, they got dragged along. So when we started the company um, 14 years ago, there was one experience that was quite unforgettable. One of, us, one of our first clients was an SME with seven branches retail. He had hired one of the big three, one of the big four, sorry. And they did a very thorough business study, checked everything, profit, loss, sales, product, everything. And they met me. They said, what do you do? And I said, well, we use design as a strategy. So what's that? So anyway, he brought me to his office. His office was in Raffles Place. We went into his room. He took out this uh, ton uh, of business plan, 56 pages, with an annex of 176 pages of data. And he said, I paid a lot of money for these guys. They are one of the best. OK, that's good. So what did they tell you? Oh, they said, I need to improve my customer service. They need to, I need to watch my margins. I need to have a better experience. OK, so do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. But you see, this is what I really know. It's a checklist. I still don't know what to do. So that gave me a realization because uh, I thought to myself that, well, here is a very expensive document that gives you a list of what to do, but doesn't give you a methodology on how to do it. And in the early days, I was thinking that I could work with one of the big four. But in those days, the big four looked at us and go like, what, design? <laughs> because there's a class, um, it's a caste system in consulting. If you're in finance, you're right at the top. You're in design, you're right at the bottom. At that time, no? now design is sexy. You know? every, every big four wants to buy a design firm. You know? We are not selling, by the way. <laughs> so, so the interesting thing was, um, we couldn't work with any of the big four, so we decided to hire some of them and force them to work with us. So then we integrated business and design as one. Because the other problem with design at that time is designers are known as last-minute geniuses. That means after you do the feasibility study, you've done the financial plan, you've done everything, oh yeah, we need to figure out how it looks. Let's call the designers in. And then you ask them, how long do we have? Well, it's supposed to be done yesterday. Can you give us a pitch? But we don't know the space. We don't know what you need. We don't know what's the cost. Oh, don't worry. You guys are geniuses. Just go have a thing and have a dream. If you have a chance to see better, to see wider, and to know that your sight will give you a better chance at winning, you will surely want to see better, isn't it? The problem with traditional management consulting at that time until now is because it gives precedence to finance, it doesn't give equal respect to the role of culture, sensibility, art, culture. That is when you make the biggest mistake of your life because everything in its right place has value. That is the difference between traditional management consulting and design thinking. In design thinking, it's not about whether business or finance is more important or HR is more important. Every aspect is more important. It's like doing a self-driving car. We need to sense everything. We need to sense the distance from the car to the next person who is coming. We need to foresee. We need to anticipate. We need to sense the tension. We need to know if the driver is sleeping to take over the wheel. That is design thinking in a nutshell. It's not checklist. It's a methodology. And it's a methodology that requires equality of disciplines. It requires you to be humble. It requires you to be mindful that every man, 
woman, space, texture, size, context, geopolitics are equally important. Now, what is an example of a checklist approach and a design approach? When Apple recovered itself from bankruptcy, Apple was still a joke. <laughs> from 1997 to 1999, Apple was still a joke. Whatever Apple tried to do, ah, those candy bar people, you know, colorful people, until Apple really, really started to make more and more money because of a systemic change. And then you have a momentum where the early 2000s, where Apple was starting to click, 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 make more and more money. So people started to say, well, let's do what they do. So again, they hire a whole bunch of management smart people. See, they have this open space, daylight space. Let's do the same. They have very little inventory in those stores. You know, technology, if, if any one of you have been in the technology business or following it long enough, people who sell technology are very boring and un, not tuned to beautiful stuff. Walk into any IT store in the 90s. I grew up in the 90s and I, I had a 286 a 386 and a 486, okay? So, you know, the, the, the this, three and a quarter inch, and I actually got a chance to go into a science exhibition because I was the only one who had a color printer in 1992. So that was an interesting but, okay, but anyway, that's history. But anyone who knows technology in those days was retail was really terrible. It was all about stack, stack, stack. It was never about what Apple did. Then when Apple did, Everyone started to copy it by checklist. But the truth is, if you do design as a packaging, as a checklist, you will never make as much money because you still don't get it. Which is the reason why, as of now, on record, Apple has still the highest revenue per square foot. But then, you have another problem. So real estate consultants come in. And this is why we need change in the consulting industry because the measure is still wrong, it's off. We cannot be talking about sales per square foot. This is a wrong measure. We need to be talking about sales by journey. This is the reason why Apple makes more money than a lot of jokers out there, because they're having the wrong measures. I've got one client. Lawrence, I paid a lot of money for this rental space. I need to pack it in. I said, oh my god. Are you talking to me about retail from the 90s? You know, it sounds deja vu. You know, I need to pack it in. It's not about packing it in. It's about bringing them into a journey a magical journey. There's a reason why we try to do, for example, it's just a simple thing. China has a lot of theme parks. They try to do by checklist. But how many theme parks in China make money? None, almost none. We nearly worked on some of them, but we backed out because we saw the, saw the ambitious plan. The only one copying and checklist, very dangerous. Yeah? But here's the thing. The biggest struggle for companies it's not about doing what someone else has, but it's to finding the motivation, the exceptional and extraordinary motivation to do something great. This is the hardest part, because most companies want shortcut. They want Maggie Mee. They want instant noodles. Hey, someone has a standard, I want the same. But if you really, really want to have financial performance through a systemic method, then it's really about thinking the whole journey. So motivation, dear friends, it's the biggest struggle of most companies today. What drives you? Are your staff restless? Are they excited to come? You know, one day I was in Wang Futing and the Li Ning store. I was walking past and the Li Ning store manager, I don't know, it was cold and they called them out and they did a ko hao. I don't know, I didn't, my Chinese is terrible. But I think they said something like, you know, let's do it, today is a great day. And it was freezing cold. And I thought that these people are nuts, but they have fire, man. <laughs> That's fire. You need to fire up people because the problem with our retail is, if we think, keep thinking that smart data, AI, you know, I've been to so many conferences and everyone says the same thing. Technology is being commoditized. There is no original thinking, blockchain. It's like, again, checklist. Checklist is good for consultants not good for business owners. So you have to ask yourself, who are you, what are you? It's not about what you sell, it's why you sell it. Is it about tasks or is it about purpose? It's like when we work with birth, we ask them, how many of you can share when you had your first child, what was it like? 
because a number of them are mothers. Have you ever heard each other's experiences of giving birth? And people teared. And when you have that level of empathy, wow, the kind of design is magical. It blows the mind. So the humble truth we have learned from 14 years, we do 90% of our work outside of Singapore. The Singapore government always asks us, why don't you do more in Singapore? I said, your grant system only allows us to do projects for one year. <laughs> but outside of Singapore, we do projects up to nine years, five years, where we can work with clients through their night of darkness, nights of depression, until the idea is giving birth. So you cannot be a nanny, like, you know, you are trying to journey with a mom, and they say, okay, okay you are going to full term, I have to leave you, bye. And, and that's when the whole brand is about to be given birth. You know, that's, that's the challenge. So, the beautiful thing is because the Singapore brand has become so much more valuable, everyone wants the Singapore story on innovation. Everyone wants a story of how did Singapore do it. That's the only reason why we have grown so fast in the last seven years. Now, we found that telling people about design thinking is not easy because a lot of people still think that design is packaging, it's just a logo, it's just texture. So we decided to take a step back and not talk about design design, but talk about business design because then it becomes easier to tell people that it is an integration of those disciplines. You still have business value, but what happens to that business value is that we can show you how it works. We can visualize it for you. It's business value made visible. But in order to do that, we realized that we had to go to leaders. We had to systemically, here is a difficult word that you don't hear all the time. You talk about transformation, no. Society needs transfiguration of methodologies. It's an entire systemic view of things if we need to appreciate new stuff. So this is what we do. We try to do transfiguration for leaders. We try to do transfiguration from cities. We are working on large city projects in Indonesia, in Thailand, in Malaysia. But it's not about building more, and we are telling them that there is an opportunity to give your citizens a stake in the country. Like for example, when you work with developers, right? most developers are not love, because they are known as land grabbers and <laughs> charge exorbitant prices that people cannot afford. <laughs> you know? So we always tell developers, you have to change your own mind. You have to transfigure your own mind to move from a property developer to a community enabler. But that requires design thinking, to think different, to excite them about what is possible in the new world. So oh, the image is not showing up. Um, what we have throughout the years is that we have an Asian uh, applied method we didn't import any Western methodology. It's homegrown from Singapore and now shared throughout the world. We're doing a lot of Industry 4.0 work. Why? Because we realized that uh, design thinking is such uh, an, a wonderful tool now for Industry 4.0 transformation. We have a partnership with the university in Tuscany. Why Tuscany? Bah, because it's beautiful. Huh? <laughs> if you want to do design thinking, you have to do it in a beautiful place. You know? So, uh, and, and of course, we, we have a chance to, of winning a number of awards for our experience design, whether it's um, branding, retail, uh, entire cities that we are working on together with CPG. So what is our methodology? Because I, as I was saying earlier, design thinking requires you to be humble, to respect the quality of finance, to respect the role of human resource, to respect the role of supply chain, to respect the role of risk management. So it is a three in one from the start line. Because traditionally in management consulting, business go first, then you have HR, then you have design. But no, all of our consultants start from the same start line at the very beginning. So what it does is when we are dealing with issues for Industry 4.0, when we are dealing with technological breakthroughs, changes in customer expectations, for example, a lot of clients have this misunderstanding. Oh, all this new technology, we cannot keep up. It's not about keeping up. It's about redefining yourself. Your customers are still going to be happy to be with you, but because you haven't de redefined yourself, that's why you think that you haven't kept up. It's not about keeping up, it's really redefining yourself, right? Now, the other thing that is becoming very critical in the, in the work that we do and we see is that because creative thinking, originality is so important, it is not enough that we have the designers, we have the business consultants, and we are working them with them. 
We need to recruit design thinkers for them, develop methodologies for them, and we're doing a lot of that piece of work. That means a company wants to set up design thinking capability in-house, we go in, we look at the business model, we help them build internal teams so that they can accelerate impact uh, quicker. This is a very sad time for the staff working in retail. Left, right, center, every headline tells them you are useless. One day you are going to be, re uh, you are going to be reduced to nothing. You know, it's like, if I were a staff working at their level. So there's no motivation actually, because it's like one day you, we don't need you, one day we don't need you. But here's the exciting news. If you see them as a cost, they will always be a cost. But if you see them as a reason for differentiation, and because so many things are going to be commoditized by data, by efficiency of supply chain, when you can activate creative excellence among people, that's when you also have the greatest uh, percentage or jump or on impact on business performance. So, what is stopping companies from doing this? You know, I'm giving a, a speech next week in Indianapolis, and this think tank that we are working with is very interesting. Their mission statement is to bring about uh, common sense solutions. And I, I, I said to Jay, Jay, you have the right mission statement because common sense is in short supply. <laughs> you know, because the problem is most companies deliberately prevent creative thinking. It's, it's, it's by design, they are, they are not allowing creativity, which is the biggest problem. So a lot of Asian companies that we study, whether we are studying their culture, we are studying their processes, we are studying how they accept a creative idea, three common keywords will come up. Ah, I've done that. Don't do it again. <laughs> okay? Oh, it'll never work. It'll never work. Oh, the other guy, oh, they are too small. Oh, they are successful, oh, because the father is rich. <laughs> oh, the other guy, you know, so all these things, part, very much of the Asian culture, you know, it cannot be done. You know, I've done it before. But the thing is, if you investigate, right, most of the time, when people say I've done it before, they've done it poorly. Design is about execution. It's not a checklist, right? It doesn't mean that if you want to be a great singer and you say, I want to sing, but if you sing badly, hello, too bad. <laughs> you got to improve your singing, okay? So th those are the things that the nuances that people don't get it. It's about implementation. Now, so there are four very, very important principles that we have learned about if we want people to succeed uh, through change by design. First of all, don't ever tell people they don't have something. Don't ever do that. Find out what they're good at doing. That is something. Every single company that we have served, there is something great about them. Give them that. Don't put them in the room and say, oh, you don't have this, oh, it's too bad, you know? You don't have this, oh, that's why you're horrible. Don't do that. Give them something to hold on to. If not, change will never happen. Number two, find something that they will cry, they will laugh, they will believe in. If you bring them through a change exercise and they stare at the screen and they are like this, you are finished. If they smile, if they recognize it, if they react to you, bam, we are $50 million in, right? So the key thing is you must spend more time finding what moves them and then you can bring them through a long process of struggle. The next thing is you need to redefine how the teams work together. All these things talk about silos and silos. Silos will always be there. But how do you find out, how do you define a comfortable common space, an effective common space for people to work together? Not for the sake of team building, for the sake of that. Again, don't give people more money to, you know, more excuses to make money from you. It's not about team building. It's about common sense, common ground to work together. So to do that, you need to accept and welcome Diversity, there will always be diversity. What is diversity we are facing with in Asia? We have a rapidly aging population. So there's this, for example, the other day I received a, uh, a message from a client and he said, is it true that young people innovate better? And I said, well, do you want to know the truth? The thing is, a lot of the young people we work with, they are very afraid to make mistakes, right? So they are holding on to conventional wisdom. And then the senior people we work with, a lot of them say, ah, we have done that, let's, let's be crazy, let's go all out, you know? It's like they are second childhood or whatever it is. <laughs> they are, let's go, step on the pedal, let's do, this, let's do this crazy stuff, you know? Yeah, so he was assured, it's okay, good. So we have a balance. So the fourth thing is new meaning. And this is when 
ultimately, you cannot be telling people, we are going to have an innovative experience. Come on, what the hell does it mean? We are going to have a meaningful experience. What the hell does it mean? What does it look like? What is the picture? What is the view? What is the, what is the scent? That, that five senses, that the ability to bring sense to strategy is extremely important in today's world. Don't talk in terms of a concept. Show them, image, this is you. This is great. And this is what it can be. And if you look at uh, Apple's journey of how it became the first US firm to reach a trillion uh, market value is this. Steve Jobs didn't do bloodletting. You know, traditional management consulting, the way to grow a company is retrain staff, cut your costs, da 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 da. But one, what Steve Jobs did quite differently was to identify who are the creative centers left in Apple. Who are his, his lieutenants, the designers, the engineers, the tech guys that he could depend on to unify the fight, the future battles that Apple must win. And this is about understanding skill set, redesigning organization, and then identifying a new business model. And at the same time, he understood that if he has to depend on the traditional IT retail channels, he will never have a chance. And that's why when they built the Apple store, everyone thought Steve Jobs was crazy. This is another one of his white elephant. But lo and behold, as a business on its own, retail is, uh, Apple is a formidable giant in the retail sector. No, so just a very simple framework for, your, for every one of you when you are thinking about your retail transformation at any, any level. The first thing is don't jump into the design, but think about what is the identity. So design strategy comes in. What is the identity? So when we worked on the Bank Islam Brunei Darussalam, this is the uh, National Bank of Brunei. The first thing first was they wanted to change the whole branch experience and everything. We didn't show them any. We were the only agency that didn't show them what it would look like. And they found it strange. Every other agency showed, oh, your branch will look like this, your logo will look like this, your uniform will look like this. And we told them, who are you? We asked them, who are you? Why are you doing this? And what's your, what's your sense of this time of Brunei? And we got a job simply because of that, because we were asking the right questions. So the first thing first was, the people of Brunei didn't feel good about themselves. When we worked on the project, one of the guys said, Lawrence, for example, in Brunei, they have the best work-life balance ever. Afternoon, nobody's around. They go and pick up their kids, you know? And, you know, we always, we and Americans always talk about work-life balance. You go to live in Brunei. They will teach you work-life balance, okay? Five o'clock, your meeting better finish. Stop talking, <laughs> yeah? But we had a workshop that ran beyond five, you know? Then one of them got fed up. He said, Lawrence, this is Brunei. Nothing moves. We are called the abode of peace, very peaceful. No change will happen. We will never beat HSBC. After they were successful, HSBC left. Because they took over their, their high net worth clients. Because we started to, to be able to acquire them because of their experience. So one thing we realized was, give them something to hold on to, define the purpose. Then the second thing was, because this bank was a merger of two banks, we couldn't talk about which bank is better. So we said, do this for the sake of Brunei. Do this for your kids, because Brunei is very family oriented. Big families, huh? That's why the branch, our entire branch experience, we must let the kids run around and everything, because the kids will invade the whole branch, you know? So, and no rough, no sharp corners. It's like designed for childcare, <laughs> okay? So, that's the thing. You have to fight for Brunei. How will you tell your kids that you have done this, you're doing this not for yourself, but you're doing this to give hope for Brunei? So they bought that, and we got it. Then when we bring them through the experience design, we realized that, wow, a lot of their branches look like immigration centers or hospitals. <laughs> they didn't look like their mini palaces when we went to their homes. So that's, that, that was the transformation. So understanding, unifying, experience design, this works. So we call this four frames. First, define the issues. What is maybe the enemy? What do you hate? Because sometimes it's very hard to tell, ask people what you like, you know, because people like a lot of things, right? My wife tries to ask me what I like. I try to ask her what she likes, but we're always confusing each other. So better not ask what you like. Ask, what do you hate? Oh, I hate this. Okay, I know. You know, it's a, it's a safer framework, right? Then de develop a style to condition, right? So what is conditioning? Conditioning is like here. If you leave this place, will you remember Conrad experience? But if you leave this place and you go like, oh, it's yeah, nice, fitting, it's beautiful. Okay, it's the same. I go to this hotel, I go to that, same. Fail, right? Then engagement, 
how do the interaction of the staff engage you? How do they make you feel human? Right? Because technology is quite easy to beat still. Yeah? AI is not very reliable for emotional responses, even though Google tried. But Google is still trying. Okay? So the last thing is take away. So it's like what Starbucks does. The Starbucks experience design team is incredible. They study how you sense the sense of place in the store. That's why every single store in the world is designed differently, according to cultural norms. They have a whole set of design thinking principles that drive the experience design. So they are not like cookie cutter, you know, churning out. Even the wood, even the textures, there is a whole case study on how Starbucks design stores. You should read it. When I read it, it was like Nirvana land. Oh, this is design thinking at its best. Okay? So influence the way pe uh, people perceive you. They even talk about scent, smell. If you walk into a Starbucks store, if certain food is too strong, it's not Starbucks enough. It's, it needs to be just nice. You know? So they have the same sense as what Singapore Airlines is trying to do. When you walk into an SQ cabin, you have a sense. This is SQ. Right, the same way they do it. But for food, it's, quite, it's, it's difficult. It's not that easy. And change the way people interact with you. So they have this thing called uh, disruptive engagement. It's like, OK, you're taking orders. Then suddenly, somebody is triggered to ask you, hey, how's your day? Wow, it's good to see you again. Busy day? That's disruptive engagement. Beautiful. And then to let people understand that they can take home something that they believe in. So we do this. And what we do is, with Brunei, you can see they're all over at the bottom. It's like trying to stab you. <laughs> we didn't say it. They told it to us because you'll be sacrilegious. You know, it's a really a very holy uh, nation. Yeah, so it's like so sharp can stab you with it. You know, like Wolverine, something like that. So anyway, when we change to that, and uh, we, did a, we did a cultural study on Brunei. So Brunei was a maritime power. The whole of East Malaysia literally was part of the Brunei kingdom. And we told them, you cannot be HSBC, but likewise, HSBC cannot claim Bruneian at heart. So that was the big unifying theme that we, we brought up for them. This was their immigration center in the past. The same immigration center today. So they are $4 billion in uh, worth. And this year, this is a number you cannot reveal to anyone. Huh? So I saw from the books. They are reaching $10 billion. Yeah. So they told us that every new branch Every staff who has gone through the design thinking transformation, they became different, they felt engaged, and that their energy levels went up, and the experience design made them feel proud to be a Bruneian, not as a sleepy town, but as a special town, as a special place. So this is what we did. Even when we went right down to design the veil, it was designed based on the Chong Sarat, which is a very expensive fabric. Each one is actually worth 20,000 Singapore dollars. And we thought, wow, this is quite good. I can buy it back, you know. And I asked the price, 20,000. I said, 20,000 in Brunei dollars, which is greater than Singapore dollars. Yes. Wow, so expensive, huh? You know, so, so that's the thing. Then the next thing is that every Brunei house is designed like a mini palace. So the warm lights, the wood paneling. And different from Singapore banks. Singapore banks, right, when you go into the concierge, they have a wall, they have a logo right behind you. But in Brunei, if you turn your back to someone, it's very rude. That's why we don't have a backing for the concierge. They can go all around. If somebody asks them, oh, yes, you know, Haja, you know, can I help you? Yeah, Haji, can I help you? Yeah. And because Brunei was built uh, as something like the Venice of the East, you know, with a, with a uh, beautiful village, so the wood decking, we took note of the colors. We took note of when people walk in, they will feel that they could run. Because as I told you, it's a family business. Huh? When they go, and go for housing loan, right? The father, the mother will go with the, you know, the newly wed, you know, and everything. And then because they get land for the southern, you know, so it's a whole family affair. So you must have a big open space for the kids to, yes, we are running to see a banking officer. I don't know whether you have such enthusiasm in Singapore or not, to see a bank, <laughs> you know. And of course, we don't know of the national flower, the simpor, which is like this magenta feel. And this magenta feel was the accent we gave to the Brunei at heart. So, uh, likewise, when we had the chance to work with Suning and Joey, we were so excited because very rarely we get the chance to do Singapore projects. And because they were trying to do something different, they said they want to reinvent themselves. And this is a company that has really been the disruptor. So when we started working with them, we understood that 
what Singapore parents lack is more, more reasons and more ideas to bond. So we say that you, you're more than just about selling products. It's about innovation and ideas for bonding, and which is what they did. Joey will, will tell you the best of the story. I won't take away her thunder because she's a great speaker. And I just want to give you a very little detail. So you see this picture, right? So this picture became the inspiration to unify the previous identity of spring maternity at the bottom, the three petals, and merge them into one, into what we call the infinite bond. And again, because design thinking requires you to think systemically throughout the entire experience, how will you do it? What are the ideas? What are the activities? How do you actualize and monetize a design idea and turn it into a design operation? Right? So we have to go through, together with them and the team, to rethink about what they need to do and how they can do it better. And based on the idea of the infinite bond, the infinite loop, uh, a whole series of characters uh, turns out that the animal kingdom is quite heartless. Only Papa Penguin <laughs> stays around. Most animals are the father, oh my God. <laughs> they disappear. You know, hail to the women, even in the animal kingdom. You know? So, so uh, th that's the whole idea of the beautiful bond. So I hope that as Joey shared the experience with you, you will also enjoy, as we have enjoyed the entire experience of working together with them to shape a beautiful bond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chong.